In mobile technology, it's the same thing over and over. New device comes out, new device gets reviewed, new device gets forgotten. Almost no one follows up, no one follows along, no one sticks around to see how well a gadget ages over time, because there's always something new to drool over. So let's do something about it. Let's have a second look at one of the best-selling smartphones of the year and the latest iteration to the smartphone that redefines smartphones. I'm Jaime Rivera with Pocket Now. This is Apple's iPhone 6, and this is episode 45 of After the Buzz. The iPhone 6 has garnered a lot of fame over the last nine months since it was launched, and that's mainly for two very separate reasons. First of all, this is the company's boldest departure from what iPhones have always been over the last eight years, and this time throwing one-handed usability out the window with its new designs. Second, well, no other smartphone has sold so many units in so little time. By now you've probably noticed that most of your friends are already using one, so if you're struggling to decide if it's worth it to buy one after the buzz, you've come to the right place. iPhones have always been prone to polarizing opinions when it comes to hardware, and this one is definitely no exception. Some find this to be one of the most beautiful phones in the market, and then others hate the horrible antenna stripes at the back and the device's infamous protruding camera. I'm inclined to not really like it, but I feel that most of these changes have actually helped the phone age well. Apple's decision to move away from chamfered edges with this model was actually a very good move, as it still looks like new for the most part. I've carried this particular unit bare in a sleeve for the last three months, and after two minor falls, all I have is a nick on one of the sides, so it's clear that Apple has reinforced the aluminum to a certain degree. Not all has been positive though, so it's fair for me to admit that this is actually the second iPhone 6 that I carry, and the third display that I test since launch date. See, there's clearly a problem in the front-facing camera assembly, where a very small white film seems to offset itself over time and threatens to cover the camera lens, even without faults to cost this. I've never really experienced problems with the selfie camera when this issue arises, but I always get my device replaced every time I go to an Apple store with the issue, so you should probably do the same if you're having the same problem. I've also noticed that even though Touch ID is more accurate on this unit, the button does make some cracking sounds after a few weeks of use, something which could also warrant a trip to the Genius Bar. Other than that, I really have no complaints with the device's hardware. Some of you may consider the device's IPS display technology to be dated when compared to AMOLEDs in the market, but I still find the color reproduction here to be good enough, though definitely not better than AMOLED. The antenna stripes haven't really suffered from coloration on this particular space gray unit, and the horrible camera hump hasn't really found any scratches, even though I was waiting for it to do so. This also continues to be the most pocket-friendly phone I've ever owned, and even though some people feel that it could be too thin or light, it is definitely one of the phones that I enjoy holding the most, particularly because of these curves on the sides. Software has also aged well in my opinion. iOS 8 was definitely the buggiest iteration Apple has ever made public, but the company has proven that it can work quickly in ironing things out. I've noticed a significant drop in app crashes with iOS 8.3, and the promise of a more conservative iOS 9 is definitely a good thing. One of my biggest complaints with the early iOS 8 was third-party keyboards delaying when switching with the emoji keyboard, and that has been solved for the most part by allowing these keyboards to provide their own emoji. On the other hand, other features like widgets are sadly something that I rarely use given the odd placement. For everything else, iOS 8 continues to be the most simplistic mobile operating system in the market. Some of you might hate that, but given the fact that Apple's target is really not oriented to power users, the rest of the world seems just fine with it. If you belong to the Apple ecosystem, you'll find a lot of things to be cool, like getting your phone calls diverted to your Mac or iPad with iOS 8. Continuity is also something I've found very useful at times, and having app suggestions pop up at the bottom over your lock screen when you're close to a movie theater or whenever you arrive at an airport is definitely something that's really cool. 
Now, my user experience with the iPhone 6 has been rather mixed. Except for a brief period of time when I replaced the iPhone for a Moto X back in February, this has been my daily driver since I unboxed it. What's driven me most to prefer it has been software reliability, its app availability, and the fact that it can handle graphics-intensive games like a champ. I'm using the 128GB model of the iPhone 6, and after packing it to the gills with games, music, and videos, I really have no complaints when it comes to its performance. Other things like call quality continue to be good, and data speeds really don't disappoint with this phone, getting a crazy 50 megabits per second down over LTE in some areas. This feature is particularly cool if you own a Mac or iPad, as connecting the iPhone's hotspot can now be controlled by these devices remotely if they're on the same Apple ID. Sadly, not everything has aged well, and one clear example is the iPhone's battery life. If you're not using an Apple Watch, you'll probably get through the day of moderate use just fine, but oddly, the Apple Watch has made my experience much, much worse. I'll rarely get through 5 p.m. on a charge lately, and I've noticed that the iPhone overheats constantly when on LTE, something which didn't happen before iOS 8.3. The second example of aging done wrong is the iPhone's camera. It is still one of the fastest smartphone cameras in the market, and it also is a great performer when it comes to most scenarios. Whether it's low light photography or during the day, it'll get the job done well, but well is sadly not enough for 2015. The 8 megapixel count on the primary camera is sadly dated, and the camera's color reproduction when compared to new champions like the Galaxy S6, Galaxy Note 4, and LG G4 is also outclassed. It's really hard to take a photo with this camera and not feel like if the results are dull when compared to most modern shooters. Apple clearly has a high point to improve with the next iPhone iteration. Video recording, on the other hand, continues to be on par with competitors, if not better, in things like slow motion video recording in addition to time-lapse mode. Overall, this is the story of buying an iPhone in mid-2015. This is definitely Apple's best iPhone ever and a very cool device for the average user, but it doesn't change the fact that some of its features have been outclassed by 2015 competition. If this was February 2015, I would have probably recommended this phone blindly to anyone, but it's really hard for me to do so now with so much awesome competition from Samsung and LG, and when the next iPhone is poised to improve all the shortcomings of this particular device. If you absolutely must have an iPhone now, then yes, this is definitely the best way to go. But if you don't, then I would highly recommend that you wait for the next iPhone. Folks, this is episode 45 of After the Buzz. We've got another 44 videos of our second looks of all the different smartphones and tablets in the market. Make sure you follow us on social media. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well, and you can follow me on Twitter, Jaime underscore Rivera. Please give this video a thumbs up if you like what you saw. I am Jaime Rivera. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you on the next one.